Well, good afternoon. Welcome to our nonprofit Mission Possible webinar. And we're excited to bring you a great panel today. We have brought out the best of the best. So if you get to see this now or later, you are going to be blown away by the great information that's provided with this panel for your nonprofit. And we're covering everything from financial assistance to how to help your nonprofit grow and get volunteers, just many ideas. So we look forward to bringing you that information today. I know that it's been challenging during this COVID-19 environment and you know, getting the fundraising that you need has been a challenge. So I wanna help you connect with some different resources today. And also, you can give each one of them a call for more advice and uh, to really extend this to a one-on-one -on -one training if you would like to. And you can look at our website. You can also view this at a later time. And we'll give you, you can also email us, look at our website for their contact information. So we are going to kick it off and just jump right into it so that we have time for questions at the end. And we're gonna start with Joanne Miller, and she is with Brook Hill Farm. And she's the Horse and Rescue Therapeutic Writing, and she's been there since 2001. And what a great person. Boy, Joanne is on my rotary. She does so much, she's such a giver. And the knowledge base that she has, I'm telling you what, is bar none. So she is an addict professor at Equine Science Randolph College. She speaks and, incult, and consults internationally at equine conferences on nonprofit business management and equine assisted therapy. And she sits on Virginia Horse Industry Board, Horses and Human Resource Foundation. And she is here to speak to us today and give us more of her knowledge and wisdom on nonprofits, how to run them, and how to make those, get those resources that you need and how she has pivoted during this COVID-19 environment. And so welcome, Joanne, take over and give us your insight. Okay, thank you so much, Wendy. If you will give me the computer screen, that would be awesome. All right. We'll see if this go. works, everybody. <laughs> Just give me one second. All right, can everybody see surviving COVID-19? Mm -hmm. Okay, welcome. As Wendy said, I started out um, as, the, as the executive director of Brook Hill Farm. We started in 2001 and we are the horse rescue for Bedford County. We were actually the, like the um, animal control for Bedford County for horses. And we also do equine assisted therapy for children. And we work with the Bedford County school system for at-risk youth, with at-risk youth. So the biggest problem, obviously, is how long can a nonprofit survive? It was really interesting. I was looking at that they said over 1 million jobs in the nonprofit industry have disappeared. That was a, a fact-finding thing that came in, into me this morning. Um, and this is obviously because donors are drying up, all our canceled fundraiser volunteers are absent, and obviously we need money for payroll and, and those kind of things. So, so this is obviously a real problem. Um, worked in the past isn't going to work in the future. So for instance, we, had a, we have our big gala plan for the fall. Obviously, that's not going to happen. That's a big amount of our income. So we're having to come up with creative ways to, to manage that. So I kind of made a COVID wheel. And it starts with be realistic, prepare, plan, create, and then execute. And again, the biggest thing about being realistic is the problem with COVID really, if you break it down, is, is really simple. It's just the human to human contact. So we really have to start thinking about how that affects our nonprofit. For instance, we do equine assisted therapy. So um, the good thing about horses is you don't want your two horses close together. So we maintain plenty of space because obviously we don't want them kicking each other. But I work with teenagers and teenagers do not socially distance. So, you know, that's probably the biggest, biggest thing to consider on everything that you do. Um, you need to be adaptable, no margin, no mission. So when we were getting ready to reopen, we were ac actually asked by the state to start 
um, when, they, when they did the first, whatever that was called, number, number one. They wanted us to open because a lot of our at-risk youth were ending up in the hospital in Christ care and things like that. So they wanted us to open back up. So we really had to rethink the whole way we do things. We usually do group therapy, groups of six to 12. Obviously we had to go down to groups of two. So, and it was cleaning and it was washing bathrooms and, you know, you almost needed to hire another person to just do all the cleaning that had to be done. But again, we had to be really adaptable. So obviously um, the CDC has some great guidelines. Um, and really, I think most of them are common sense. You can kind of just read down what I have. Um, I think the biggest thing for us, especially in the fundraising and as the executives is preparing for the event ca cancellations and coming up with new ideas um, and be prepared for your disruption and that can, least, that can last at least a couple of weeks. How are you going to be prepared to, to have that be able to maintain? And obviously the human to human um, contact is the big deal again. So you need to think about social distancing, distancing and explore creative ways to give your services um, out. The biggest issue we have is most of our children are from lower income homes, so they don't have internet. A lot of nonprofits are delivering services by internet. We were not able to do that. So we had to form new ways of commun communication. And can some of your employees obviously work from home? So again, prepare. The more money we raise, the more lives we can change. And I think that goes for all our nonprofits. And we need to plan. And I'm gonna kind of get into, again, nonprofit business management, something that I teach. And I think one of the biggest problems nonprofits have is they don't know the cost of their unit of service. So I had a very, I did it very, a very simple way to do this. And please feel free to contact me if you're interested. But take your total expenses of everything you spent in 2019. And I'm going to give you a very simple number so we don't have to think about math. So $50,000. So if we're thinking of our budget for 2020, we need to raise $50,000 to be able to keep that, say, one, one um, employee or whatever we have. So if you go out to your donors right now and say you need $50,000, they're just going to laugh at you <laughs> because they, they don't have that kind of money to give right now during this pandemic. So you're going to look at the total number of services given. Say we gave services to 100 people. We're going to divide the expenses by service which would be, that brings us down to 500. And we're gonna talk about the average time we spent delivering the service. So take that person and figure out how many times you touched that person. Let's say we touched them for 50 days. Let's get our core number for delivering that service. We're gonna divide it out and it's $10 per day. So one of the things that Brooke Hill did is our core number was $20 and we put a, a um, a blast, an email blast out and said, hey, you know, to deliver an hour of service to our clients, it's $20. Can we please, you know, can you send us $20 so, so an at-risk youth can get an hour of service? And we found this was a huge fundraiser for us and we raised enough money that we could function for another month. But again, we were asking for a very small amount that was very easily, easily doable for everybody. So again, this cost of unit of service is really key because again, more people are willing to give me say $10 per day than they would if I told them I needed a budget of 50,000. Um, you need to be creative and you need to execute what you create. So let's get fundraising. Some of the things you can do virtually is a virtual walk. This is a, an, a great idea. I have not done this, but um, a person in my group has done this. Um, participants pay an entry fee and what they did is they, they gave an amount of miles to walk, say 25 miles, and they got their friends to pledge that they would walk the 25 miles and, and the money was given to the organization. This is no volunteers, no insurance, anyone can participate, anyone can participate from anywhere, so family and friends. And this, this was a good fundraiser. I wanna say they raised about $15,000 with this. A watch party. Um, choose a movie related to your cause. Um, we're a horse rescue, so, you know, Black Beauty or, you know, Spirit. Um, schedule a time, ask for donations or sell tickets and then send tickets for movie snacks ahead of time if you really want to get that involved. So that's another clever idea. An open house. We're not doing open houses in per per person, but you can do a virtual open house. 
Um, one of the things um, some of the farm people are doing um, that are doing therapeutic riding is they're having drive throughs So people literally come in their car and drive by and see the horses and give a donation at the door. So, you know, people want to get out of the house and that, that has worked really well where they could drive around the farm. So, you know, start to, start to think creatively. How can you get people to your place of business? You know, you can't be there in person. Can you do it virtually? Online contests. Please look at this picture. Our online, our online contest was designing a dress out of toilet paper. This went over really big. Um, Wenner, this is the Statue of Liberty. Um, and again, we, we had a, a small fee for them to enter. And again, everybody staying at home. Uh, of course, you know, it's kind of sad we wasted the toilet paper, but again, um, this was really fun to do it with duct tape, whatever. And then virtual classes. We do a lot of online education. Um, in the past, we have not charged for education. So we, we have been doing this free of charge, but at the end, I have a, do have a donate button. And, and since COVID has started, people are actually donating for our free education classes. So that has been another great fundraiser. And of course, the Amazon wish list, if you're not connected with that, uh, many donors feel better about donating items instead of giving money. And of course, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Um, there's a whole lot of information of, on this online. It does not have to be com complicated. A lot of what we do here is if somebody has a birthday, we act, ask them to put it on Facebook that it's their birthday that donate to your, their, your favorite cause. So again, that's a great one. And then I was talking to Wendy a little bit um, earlier about something that I do for grants. Um, those grant opportunities are hard to find and of course to belong to one of the foundations you know to like grant foundation or some of those it's really expensive there is a free um, place called GuideStar and if you've never heard of GuideStar it's the most complete up-to-date nonprofit data organization and they have free resources on there they have a newsletter webinars and a blog which is great but what they're really good about is the ability to look up grants. Now you can't say that I'm looking for, for say for me, a therapy grant for at-risk youth, but if I hear of a grant, I can go and look up this grant. It will give me all the information about their organization. You can view who and what they fund. And the best part of it is you can snoop and look at their tax returns. So for instance, there's a great um, animal grant that I, that I found. And I looked on the website, on the GuideStar website, and I found the, the, the man who gave this grant. And then I looked at his tax returns, and the tax returns were there for the last three years. Well, on the tax return, they give, all, they give you the information on all the money that they give out. So I was able to find that the average amount that he gave a animal rescue group was $2,500. And I also found out what he gave it for. Did he give it for food, feed and grain? Did he give it for, you know, so I was able to really target that information. It has their website information. It's a fabulous resource. Not only that, oops, sorry, but you can put your own nonprofit profile on there. And what you want to do for free, and that's how you get all this information. And what you really want to do is become a platinum member. And the reason you want to be a platinum member is because it shows your transparency. All your information is there. It is labor intensive the first time you do it. But I have had people go on GuideStar and find me and I get a check out of the blue. I just recently got a check for $15,000 because somebody who was looking for somebody to give a grant to saw my profile and I matched what they were looking for. So now they're becoming a, a you know, they'll become an annual donor. So it kind of works both ways. So that's an, another fabulous way, especially now that you have a little time on your hands, fill out this and the next year, everything transfers. So then it's just updating, but it is labor intensive the first time but it has definitely paid off for us. So, uh, and like I said, Granters, can you look you up? And so the Granter that looked us up was looking at our therapeutic writing program. And that's, that's a picture of. So, and I think that we were gonna ask for questions at the end, but that this is my email and my name is Joanne. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I also have a business plan template if you're interested. Um, it's how to do a business plan in, in just an hour. So 
Anyway, I'll pass it back over to Wendy. Thank you so much, Joanne. That was so informative. I cannot waste, wait to post this. You know, lots of nuggets in there and every single nonprofit would get something out of that. And so thank you for presenting that to us and look forward to talking to you more, but we'll get that template and we can post it on our website too, Joanne. Probably. Okay, that'd be great. And we'll put it under right near where this webinar is gonna go. And so thanks again for all of that. Um, so next up for giving us some great nuggets of information is Tim Saunders and Tim is phenomenal. Tim comes from a TV background on the news who we watch all the time. So we still get to see you. I'm so thrilled. And so getting more knowledge base from you. But Tim is a business engagement outreach coordinator at uh, Central Virginia Planning District. He has so Virginia Career Works. He is the Emmy and Morrow Award winning journalist with more than 15 years of professional experience in TV and news. So he's got a lot of knowledge base. Central Virginia Planning District Commission Business and Engagement Outreach Coordinator. That's a lot to say. So we know he's got a lot of knowledge behind that title, but thank you for bringing it today and for letting us know how we can be helped with our nonprofits. Thank you so much, Wendy. I appreciate that introduction. And as you mentioned, I do work for the Central Virginia Planning District Commission. That is where we are sort of housed as far as my organization goes. Uh, but I represent Virginia Career Works. Uh, that's the name that we go by in the community for uh, workforce development. Uh, I represent the Central Virginia Workforce Development Board, which falls under the Planning District Commission. And our public facing name is Virginia Career Works. And this is a relatively new name in our community. This is a name that was developed by the Virginia Workforce Development System about two years ago. But the thing you need to understand about us is that we're here to serve both job seekers and employers. And we're sort of the connection between the two. So regardless of whether you're someone who's looking for employment or you're the one offering employment, we're here to help. And that includes nonprofits because obviously nonprofits are employers. And so we want you to know that our services are available for you, but we also want you to know what services we offer so that if you need to take advantage of them, you can come see us. And also you can share the word with other nonprofit leaders and business leaders in the community because uh, we do wanna be there to help, especially right now with what we're experiencing with the COVID crisis. So just an introduction to explain what Virginia Career Works is. Again, our workforce development system is a system of partners. We bring together a lot of different groups in addition to the workforce development board, which is made up of leaders in our community in the business and industry, we work with a number of state agencies and nonprofits. The three that we work with most closely are the Virginia Employment Commission, the Department of Aging and Rehabilitative Services, and Adult and Career Education of Central Virginia. We have a building on Oddfellows Road in Lynchburg that we are in with the Virginia Employment Commission, so we're there with them together. But we work with all these organizations, including Humankind. Humankind actually operates our facility there on Odd Fellows, and they also are the operator of our, what we call Title I adult and youth programs under the Workforce, or excuse me, the uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, a very important uh, government uh, entity that oversees a lot of what we do in workforce development. Uh, but we also work very closely with the Old Dominion Job Corps. Old Dominion Job Corps is one of 131 job corps in the country. And we're very lucky to have the Old Dominion Job Corps here in our region. It's one of only two in Virginia. And this is uh, an organization that exists to train young people between, uh, I think it's the ages of 16 and 24. Uh, it exists under the Department of Labor. And it brings hundreds of people to our area for vocational training. They actually live at a facility in Amherst County, and we work very closely with them to help them find employment. They're getting the training there at Old Dominion Job Corps, and then we work closely with them to help those young people find employment once they're trained. We work with social services. We also work with the Lynchburg Community Action Group. Many of you may know them as LINCAG. They're, of course, an organization that works with low to moderate income individuals in our area. 
and families as well. We work with Goodwill, which by the way, is a training provider, believe it or not. They offer a lot of soft skills training, especially right now they're offering uh, help just like we are at Virginia Career Works. I'm gonna be talking about that in a moment. They offer training for folks who wanna get back into the workforce, things like tips with resumes and, and interview skills. Um, we work with local libraries. In fact, local libraries are a point of contact for Virginia Career Works. In addition to that physical center I was talking about on Oddfellows Road, which by the way, is still closed at the moment, we do often offer services in person at our local libraries. We're having to dial back on that at the moment just because of what we're going through right now with uh, COVID-19, but we do hope once it's safe again to do so, that we will be back in the libraries again, meeting with people and offering some of the services that I'm gonna be talking about here in a moment. And of course, we work with Central Virginia Community College. They are a major training provider in our region, and we work very closely with them to help train individuals who are uh, already in the workforce or trying to enter the workforce. We want to make sure that our employers in the region have a skilled workforce that's ready to meet the demands of the business and industry that exists here and those who want to operate. wanting to advance to the next slide. So one of the things that we work together on here, uh, all the partners, is rapid response. This is a way that we sort of work to help employers who may be struggling and also employers who have made the difficult decision to leave our area or lay off employees. Virginia Career Works and its partners, we are available to assist both the employer and the employees. We just recently, in the last couple of weeks, have been working to help uh, an industry there in Bedford, a longtime employer in the Bedford area. Many of you know them as Wheelabrator. They now go by the name Winoa. Unfortunately, at the end of the month, they're going to be shutting down their facility in Bedford, and about 38 people are going to be impacted. And so we've been helping them with rapid response. And what this is, is this is services that are delivered in a situation that we refer to as mass job dislocation, whether again, it's a layoff or a job a plant closing, that sort of thing. Um, rapid response exists to help minimize the negative impacts that come when a layoff happens, when workers are dislocated, when a business leaves the community. It obviously doesn't just impact the employees, it also has a ripple effect throughout the community economically. And so we work as much as we can to try and ensure rapid reemployment of the individuals that are impacted. We want to get those people who have lost their jobs back to work in gainful employment as soon as possible. And so that's, this is one of the things that we are doing right now in Bedford specifically. We're trying to find these workers who've been laid off at Winoa new positions. And they're highly skilled people. They've, they've got transferable skills that other companies will find valuable. And so that's one thing that we're trying to do right now is help them find jobs. We're assisting them with both looking for jobs, but also with some of uh, the, the things that come along with that, the interview skills, the uh, preparing of resumes. These are things that are available all the time at our Virginia Career Works uh, one-stop center that we have on Oddfellows Road, the Virginia Career Works Lynchburg Center. You can come there at any time. And once we reopen, we hope to be uh, back open again very soon. Once we physically reopen, we will be available by appointment to offer those services to people. But we offer that through rapid response. We also provide financial assistance for people who have been displaced by a, a mass dislocation event, a layoff or a plant closing. Uh, we provide them with a, a number of things. We try to do job fairs for these people. We, we hope to have a virtual career fair for specifically for these people in the manufacturing sector sometime next month. We just did a virtual career fair last week for healthcare employers. And so uh, we, we do offer that as, as an opportunity for people. We do coaching, uh, interview coaching. But in terms of financial assistance, we of course connect them with the unemployment insurance that's provided through the Virginia Employment Commission. And we try to give them money for training and education if they need to train for a new career, if they want to move into something that maybe is different than what they've done in the past, we wanna help them get that training. And uh, since it costs money, we wanna provide the money for them to be able to do that at no cost to them or at little cost to them. 
And if they want to go back to school, earn a degree, associate's degree, or, or something uh, higher up than that, we want to give them the assistance that they would need to do that as well. So we just try to provide a, a support in any way that we can. We, we do try to meet their basic needs as well. We connect them with resources so that they can find food and clothing and shelter. We connect them with the nonprofits like some of your organizations maybe in the community that provide those things. But the one thing I want to emphasize here, the one thing that we really try to do uh, is avert layoffs. We don't want it to get to the point where uh, a company is having to lay off employees or shut down and move to another uh, city, another state, another country. In this case with Winoa, they're moving outside of the United States. We want to try to avoid that when we can. And so th this is where you come in. We, we definitely want you all to help us with that. Uh, but one way that we do try to help companies with layoff or with yeah, layoff aversion is with incumbent worker training. This is upskilling. This is where we take people who are already working for an organization and help them train for new jobs that might make them more marketable and make the company more marketable. Uh, automation, for example, if, if there are people who've been manually doing something within an organization or a company, we want to help them uh, upskill to be able to operate the automated machinery or oversee the automated uh, equipment that would be perhaps replacing some of the workers there. We, we just want to try to help workers and help the workforce stay trained as much as possible to meet the demands of industry in our region. We also provide on-the-job training, and this is something that I, I feel may be underutilized. We have money available to help people who are entering the workforce train for jobs in our community, in-demand jobs and, and just jobs in general. You know, if, if you want to hire a worker and they don't necessarily have the training uh, to do the job, but you think they would be a good fit for your organization, we have money available to help pay part of the, the training costs for that individual while they're employed with your organization. They can be trained on the job and, and have some of that training paid for. Most importantly though, we wanna to try to build up the career pipeline uh, for businesses and nonprofits in our region. We want to be uh, sort of a, a source, if you will, of workers for the businesses and industries that exist here. So we're always looking around and trying to see what are the in-demand positions that exist in our region or what are some of the jobs uh, that would be a good fit for our region. We're always trying to build up that pipeline of workers so that the companies that are already here have the, have the people they need to fill their positions. And then when companies are looking at our region, when economic developers are uh, introducing companies outside the region to Central Virginia, to the greater Lynchburg area, we want them to see that, hey, there are workers already here that can easily do this job. They're highly trained, they're prepared, they can meet the needs of my company and I wanna locate here and create jobs in this region. So we're always trying to build up that career pipeline any way we can. And we do provide financial support for employers, for nonprofits as well. We, we do provide money and assistance, uh, again, as I said, on the job training and other services as well uh, to help you uh, build up your workforce. So how can you help? One thing that we want you to do is if you hear that a company is struggling or a business might be struggling, refer them to Virginia Career Works. Make them aware of what exists as far as support so that we can get in touch with them or perhaps someone in the economic development community can get in touch with them to begin the conversation and at least try to avoid layoffs. Because sometimes these, we find out about these things too late when, it's, when we're not able to help stop what's happening. Uh, and I think if the communication, if the line of communication was open, we could perhaps step in and offer assistance. So just make them aware of the services that are provided and then get in touch with us. Let us know as well and ask us for help. We're always wanting to get out there and help our businesses and nonprofits. One thing you can do as a nonprofit is register in the Virginia Workforce Connection. If you're wanting to hire, if you are needing to hire new employees, if you pay into the unemployment tax system here in Virginia. There are 501c3s that do pay unemployment tax. If you fall in that category, you can register as an employer in the Virginia Workforce Connection and you can be connected with job seekers, people who are out there right now who have indicated that they're looking for work. Workers register in this system when they are seeking employment 
and they put in information about themselves, uh, what they're looking for in terms of their jobs, the skills that they have, the education they have. And then the Virginia Employment Commission, along with uh, the Workforce Development Board, we work to connect those people. We work to match the job seekers with employers. So if you as an employer have a job that you are wanting to advertise, this is a great place to go and do that. You just need to register there as an employer if you haven't already in the Workforce Connection and create a job order and then we take care of the rest. We will match your employer, you will match your job with the employees that you need to fill that position. So again, we're here to help. If you wanna contact us, my email address is there on the screen. It's tim.saunders at vcwcentral.com. You may also wanna reach out to uh, our workforce development director, Ben Bowman. He is a great resource. He knows so much about this process, workforce development, and ways to help you as a nonprofit. And you can also chat uh, with our staff at the Virginia Career Works Lynchburg Center. I mentioned the training that we have available for people who are jo seeking jobs right now. Um, if they are needing help with their resume, if they're wanting some interviewing skills or, or help with that, we are available right now uh, by a live chat through our website, and you can also call us by phone. Uh, we are available over the phone to provide assistance as well, and you can also email us there at info at vcwcentral.com. So bottom line, just know that we are here to help. We would love to help, and if you know of a company or a business or a nonprofit that's struggling, do get in touch with us so that we can provide that assistance. Wonderful, thank you so much, Tim. What great information, and we're so glad that you're here to service our businesses and our community. So thank you again for what a great um, PowerPoint presentation, and we'll definitely have that up for anyone and everyone to see later. Um, so next up is going to be Sharice Chambers, Financial Fancy, and we are thrilled to have her on. She specializes with nonprofits and bookkeeping. She draws upon 12 years in the field for tax preparation that lays the foundation for guidance and bookkeeping to help our business owners create long-term sustainability and accountability So, uh, with their business finances. So we appreciate her and her knowledge and what she's gonna bring today. Uh, she speaks to multiple industries on how to set their budgets, create product uh, pricing and tax education for small business owners and nonprofits and she's a professional QuickBooks, and she does one-on-one um, -on -one sessions as well. So if you would like to contact her after the session, please let us know, and we'll put you in connection with her and her expertise. So with that, we're gonna ask you to take over and give us your information today, and thanks again, Sharice. Oh, you're welcome. So I don't have a PowerPoint presentation because I'm still in tax season, so we just gonna be talking to each other face-to-face, -face, so. Um, Thank you so much for having me today, Wendy. So I was thinking over our conversation and what to present, and I have like six points that I really have been having discussions about, talking about, mulling over all the things of nonprofit life and what it looks like right now in the midst of COVID. So one thing I'd encourage you to do as, and basically Joanne just gave my whole presentation because everything I wanted to say, I was like, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> so. I'm going to say a lot of things. I'm going to mirror a lot of what she's saying is because we're on the same wavelength. We're thinking the same thing. The very first thing is I want you to reassess your budget and not just think about your budget. I want you to pull out your profit and loss sheet and look at each item line by line. Like when's the last, like I know, look, I'm on a board too. And, and when we talk about the finances, people just want to know, do we have money or we don't, right? They never read the portion of the finances when we start talking about what's happening. As long as we got money, then everyone's fine. But the reality of the situation is you need to go in and do the work and start digging. So when you look at your budget, start asking questions and also doing comparisons with your budget, right? So if you do a pro, um, so I do bookkeeping for the listening and they started the Freedom School last year. Well, Freedom School is not happening this year, but they raised a lot of sponsorship money and um, one of the things was, what are we gonna do with this money? Well, first the thing we need to do was acknowledge all of the restricted funds that we received for the class, right? With all those donors, because they're like, well, if you're not gonna use the money that I sent you to do the school with, now you're not gonna do school, what, what does that look like, right? Because 
We haven't gotten any letters back to say, hey, I want my money back, but we need to do something with those funds, right? And I think going over our budget, we were able to um, isolate how much money we spent for each programming. And very much like Joanne said, figuring out what that dollar amount is for you to promote it. Because there's so many different ways that you can promote and do your marketing program and what does that look like. And you don't know where to start with your marketing if you don't know your numbers for your budget. So you need to know the number part to be able to assess what it is you need to switch up in your budget. My next point was discount cutting costs. I know you've got, we have what, um, I've had conversations again with a lot of nonprofits and they've cut staff, you know, people have been sent home, part-timers were laid off, whatever the situation might be. And I think a lot of times we run our business so much like a business that we um, kind of forget and lay to the side practical practices we use in our own households to save money. Like when you guys go buy bulk items from Walmart or you can't use coupons at Sam's Club, but are you signed up for those kind of membership discount programs in certain areas? So a lot of people, I find out, actually I come, unbeknownst to myself, I was thinking a lot of nonprofits aren't signed up with Amazon where if people, the partnership, so you get a kickback every time somebody buys on Amazon. I mean, how many people have now, they are at home buying on Amazon like never before. Imagine how much money you have, could have gotten from a donor on, from their, on their behalf, a check cut to you is called Amazon Smiles. Um, if they were buying those products now that they're home from COVID that the, that the nonprofit could have been receiving. And all you have to do, it takes 30 minutes, 30 minutes to sign up, and get people and or actually the person has to tell you know you have to sign up but then the person has to tell them where to put the funds at i was thinking about doing a video about that but it's something to think about right and it's it costs them nothing but to say hey i want this money to go to these people um kroger's does it too if you sign up you have them they get um rotary a uh, rotary we get kickbacks from the monies that people buy at kroger's and people are at home right and people are going grocery shopping and people are shopping on amazon i I'm not an Amazon shopper, but I've shopped more on Amazon now because of COVID. So let's think about those things. When you, um, there's another space called Rakuten, R-A-K-E-T-U-N, I believe. It, it used to be called um, something else. But basically, when you buy stuff online, it gives you a kickback. So if you buy, I, I buy stuff from Office Max. If you spend over $30, you automatically get free shipping. We're thinking about saving our time and our money, right? I don't want to waste time doing curbside. Okay, I want I don't I want as less amount of contact with people as possible, right? Because we're in COVID. If you have free shipping, you know, buying a rim of paper is more than thirty dollars, right? So you buy the paper, you're already gonna get free shipping. But if you buy it from Rakuten, they give usually somewhere between two and ten percent back. So you're going to make money on money you're already spending. So think of spaces that you buy money and how you can use discounts within your nonprofit that you might be using home practical ways. I know some people don't think about coupons. And again, I do personal finances too. So couponing lessons are always something I, I preach because it's, my thought process is not that you can't have the life that you want, but it's like what in what um, boundaries can you get that? I might want to buy a Maserati, right? I don't want to buy a Maserati. <laughs> want a fancy car but what are the things that you need to do to obtain that i'm not saying you can't do fill in the blank like go out to eat every day but if you go out to eat three times a day right it's not that you can't do because i think that's we live in um de in definite spaces a lot of people are like if they can't do it at all then they don't want to do it you know if they, if they can't then they don't want to do anything portion of it but there's a way to do it in moderation and still be able to obtain the goal that you're trying to get to okay the next thing I was going to talk about are job roles. I think this is a taboo space and a lot of people don't talk about it, but let's be totally honest. When I was working a nine to five, every job for the most part that I've ever worked, I end up becoming a middle manager. And what I mean by that is I never quite was able to become a manager. They, they, there's this one particular job. They always kind of handpick the people who they wanted to be in those positions. But they always gave me responsibilities as a manager, but never wanted to pay me as a manager. I was more than willing to do the extra work because it was my sweet spot. I'm someone who delegates very easily and takes managerial um, tasks very easily. 
If you find people, if their hard skills align with the task at hand, they'll do more work for you, not for less money. So imagine this, think of somebody, I know you can think of one person who you can give all the tasks to, they are killing in all the deadlines, right? And they're almost working in a, in a space of like two people. So if you have someone, when you hire someone or when you're giving out tasks, you need to give tasks out in a way that speaks to the person's skill set. I know sometimes we give people, delegate tasks to people, but sometimes it's not their strength. You need to find people who already work for you or who you plan on hiring now that we're coming back on COVID and we're volunteers and stuff. Figure out what actually aligns with them so that they can be more efficient within the nonprofit. Like I do bookkeeping. I'm gonna tell you, as me, I work at Riverview. I do bookkeeping for Riverviews. And I'm always hollering at Steven, hey, can you put ink in the printer? Cause I, he's like, I'm not the IT guy. He, he does a multitude of things at Riverviews, but that's just not my ministry. I don't, look, I don't know how to put ink in, the, in the, the printer that we use. I just need the ink to run so I can run checks, okay? That's, you know, so, but because I know what I'm best at, I do it very efficiently and it does not take me a long time See how that goes? When you hire somebody to do something that works for them, it doesn't take them an eight hour day to, you know, fix the website. It might take them a four hour day and then you pay them for four hours, not eight hours. See where I'm going with that? Okay. The next one is donor write-offs. I know a lot of people don't talk about it because it's the flip side, but the CARES Act added a line where um, if you don't meet your standard deduction, um, you can still write off your donation portion. And I know that I've, always, I've been toying with the idea of what does that look like in marketing, telling people, hey, give a donation because it's a tax write-off, right? Because <laughs> pe people, people are really looking for what the benefit is. I hate to say it, most people, not everybody. I mean, when you do something, you're thinking, what's the benefit of it, right? But mm -hmm. it's a benefit to us and our community, right? So if you could find a way to market that, tell people, hey, if you give, if you give a donation, you can actually write off on your taxes. That think, think that through and what that looks like. Um, donor love. This is the time for your big ticket donors to tell them you love them, okay? So if that looks like a marketing campaign, an email, a handwritten letter, because let's be honest, we got time on our hands. And those standard letters of thank you so much for your donations is just not cutting it. If you want the big money, they'll make people feel warm and fuzzy. And that's also about community. Um, I love handing out thank you notes. Like if somebody, Wendy, I can tell you right now, you go get a thank you card after this for inviting me here. Those are the things that keep community. And it's not that I'm looking for something, but it's just, it's a communication thing. It's, it's, it's just great customer service. It's great business. It's just great friendship all around, right? Whatever the case may be. Um, and then something I learned in the session that Stephanie had mentioned earlier when we were talking, um, that Jennifer did was, is doing a start stop and a shelf. I, I changed the last word. So you can, you need to figure out now as you're pivoting what you want to start and, and let's um, layer all the things we've already talked about, like looking at your budget. What does it look like to start since you're not doing the summer camp program? What do you want to start in place of that? And what does that look like? Something that you're going to stop again the thing the summer camp right you got to stop the summer camp because that's not possible right but what does it look like if you pivot and then shelving something you might not be able to do it right now but need put it on the shelf for a later time because let's be honest we spend a lot of time thinking about this money and all the donors and and the responsibility we have onto the community and you're you do no one um a service you do yourself a disservice if you are um, working in a space of anxiety and losing sleep over the monies and COVID, you can't change COVID, right? We have to deal with what the reality of the situation is right now so that you can best assess yourself and position yourself to be in a space where you can see yourself a year from now or six or shoot, now we live in, I'm living 30 days at a time at this point because I don't, I don't even know what 2021 looks like. Okay, we, I done canceled all of 2020. So um, if you can, because my belief is what growing up, being the executive director where you work at is not a if something will happen. It's a when. And the best, you, the best way you can be prepared is trying to think of all the what ifs so that when they happen, you can execute in that manner at the best of your ability 
because you've already put the things in place. So I know you guys are ordering sanitizer, you're ordering all the <laughs> PPE, you know, for getting ready for our, what phase three happening on the first, right? Make sure you keep those things in stock. Make sure you use coupons when you buy them. Make sure that you are, you know, using that money if you got approved for any of the loans and the spaces um, that you can delegate them in. And the last thing too I wanted to say is if you got money for um, PP, PPP or EID loan, put them in different, um, I, I would suggest putting them in a different bank account. I've noticed some people have been mushing them with their regular operating expenses. I'd suggest separating them so you can see how much money you're spending out of it and then make sure you keep them receipts because we don't know what's going to look like when the IRS finally decides they want to audit us and see if we was using it the way we were supposed to. We have no verbiage of what that looks like, but you know, if you are ready now, if you, you don't have to um, get ready if you stay ready. So when they go come, you just don't know when, right? So um, that was pretty much the gist of what I wanted to say. Just give you guys some thought process and hope that you guys are staying safe and that um, you're able, you you have been able you have already done the due diligence when this happened. I know we couldn't expect something as dramatic as this and stopping funds, but um, that's what preparation is. So, you know, now what is your one, three and five year plan look like for your nonprofit now in your reset, right? So this is thought process. Thanks again, Miss Wendy for having me and I hope I said something that helped you guys. Thank you, Sharice, great nuggets and I'd like to have you on another time so we'll talk about that she has such wealth of information and that was just a tidbit of it but what what a great start so we'll give you more time later and Stephanie Keener who is our professional I'm telling you what she brings it every time director at Small Business Development Center top skills is fundraising event planning and nonprofit so perfect for for you today. If you're on for the nonprofit, certifications are export and trade counseling certificate. Uh, Virginia real estate license. I learned that about you. I didn't realize. And that well, was actually I let it expire in December. Oh, so you did. thank oh. you for thank you for reading my LinkedIn profile. There was um, your LinkedIn, that, exactly. That was... um that reminded me I need to go and uh, update that. <laughs> okay, there you go. Well, I was curious. I was like, oh, I didn't realize she had this girl does everything. So awesome. And she understands communities uh, very well and she can um, help develop and transform through guidance. So you can do one-on-ones with her as well. And uh, she can help everyone at any phase. So definitely encourage you to give Stephanie a call. Wealth of information. But we're so thrilled that you're on here today. Look forward to what you're going to bring. So take it over, Stephanie. And I think the screen is up to share. Let me know, though. Yeah, let me just go ahead and share my little short presentation. Um, I always get a little... You know, we always get a little weird when we when we start sharing our screens, right? right? And I'm also used to having two screens, so I can usually go back and forth pretty quickly, but I'm only on one today. So if you see me like reaching out in a weird way, that's why I'm on a different setup than normal. Um, well, as Wendy said, I'm Stephanie Keener. I'm the executive director for the Virginia Small Business Development Center that serves the Litchburg region. Um, I have been the uh, SBDC director for a couple of years, but I've actually been with the program for about six years and we do serve Bedford County. Um, and I, we work with a lot of businesses and nonprofits in Bedford County as well. And I know that a lot of people are probably thinking, well, why is the Small Business Development Center here talking to nonprofit organizations? Well, that's because we can serve you um, as, as, organizations that in many of the same ways that we can um, small businesses. We do have, um, you know, we're part of the, the network of organizations that can counsel and mentor other, other small businesses. And, um, and that includes our nonprofit community. We have several nonprofit clients actually. And, um, you know, particularly in a community like ours, where some of our largest employers are nonprofit organizations, um, I think that it would be it would be really wild if we didn't if we didn't um, serve those those folks. 
but we are part of a national organization. We are um, funded by the Small Business Administration. About half of our funding comes from the SBA and that the other half is matched by our local governments. So in our case, those are the, the localities that we serve, which are Bedford County, the city of Lynchburg, Amherst, Appomattox, Campbell County, and the town of Alta Vista. Um, the Virginia SBDC is headquartered at George Mason University. We work as a network and, you know, we often laugh because we have, we have some great folks who work with the SBDC here in the Lynchburg region, including Sharice. Um, who leads our Start Smart program for us, but we also have about a hundred people who work across the Commonwealth with the Virginia SBDC network and pretty often if um, if just among our our folks at that serve the Lynchburg region, if we don't know the answer, I can we can turn around and ask the rest of our network and figure that out. And let me tell you something. In the COVID-19 period, we were really working hard as a network. Our, I think we maybe blew up the listserv at George Mason University because we were sending so many emails um, trying to help our clients work through PPP and um, EIDL questions. So it was pretty amazing. Um, we are locally hosted at downtown Lynchburg at the, at the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance, which is our regional um, chamber and economic development organization. And we are an accredited member of our America's SBDCs, which is our professional organization for small business development centers. We do a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one counseling and advising, and we're, we are trained to do that. And um, we you know, have oversight not only with our local partners at the Alliance and at, at George Mason University, but also through, you know, federally at the SBA and through our professional organization at the SBDC. So basically, in a nutshell, all of that means the Virginia SBDC network is a partnership between the US SBA, George Mason University, and premier institutions throughout Virginia. We, um, we do a lot of things for our communities. We are, like I said, we're statewide infrastructure. We help do job creation initiatives through, you know, helping small businesses get started. We're an economic development program. We can assist uh, organizations, small businesses with access to capital, um, figuring out your better marketing strategies. Um, we can answer questions about HR issues, um, thinking about expanding products and services. And we actually have 29 SBDCs across the Commonwealth and serve every jurisdiction in Virginia. And I wanna pause here just for a second um, and kind of focus on what some of those specific services are that the SBDC does. Um, like I've mentioned a couple times, we do one-on-one -on -one mentoring and counseling advising for small businesses. That is a free confidential service. Um, people kind of get, really surprised by that. <laughs> but you know, you've already paid for that, right? We are, um, we are your tax dollars at work and um, no one for one-on-one -on -one advising and counseling. Um, if you, if you want to meet with us and just ha ask a question, um, that is always a free confidential service. We will never charge for that service. We do training workshops. We have a lot of training workshops that are specifically targeted on COVID-19 um, economic recovery for our small businesses and organizations. We are gonna be announcing lots of different things in the coming weeks. Um, one thing which I've, we've already, you've heard us mention a couple of times that we do is uh, something called Start Smart, which is our small business start program. We have a couple of those dates coming up in Bedford in September. If you go to our website, sbdclunchburgregion.org, you'll see that um, those are, I don't remember the exact days, but those are in September. They're at the library, um, one of our, among our many nonprofit and uh, government agency partners. Um, we also do some really highly specialized topical training. So for example, coming up in September, we have a new training called risk management or risk assessment and mitigation. Um, that's going to be a two-day set of workshops with um, 
facilitators, Jennifer Woofter and Bill Bond, who own um, consulting businesses who work with that in that field um, to help us understand how our organizations are impacted by things like global pandemics or natural disasters or any of the, the myriad of other things that we don't normally think about, but we need to be prepared for. Um, you know, financially, how do we handle human resources? If um, there is a pandemic that impacts China, how does that impact our supply chain here in the United States? Or um, we had several small businesses who didn't realize until this spring how their supply chain was connected to Northern Italy. So, <laughs> you know, um, those kinds of things. So helping small businesses understand that kind of risk management. That will be coming online in September. We also have another um, training coming up called the Business of Healthcare. So if you are um, a healthcare agency, if you see patients, and I think, you know, even animal patients, so if you're a veterinarian or you, you serve animals in some way, um, we have an organization, or uh, I'm sorry, a training coming up called the Business of Healthcare, and that's based on lean management principles. We're actually um, partnering with Virginia Tech to deliver that program. Those programs, a program like that, the for example, the Business of Healthcare, because it's a multi-month program, we do have um, a tuition fee for that. But we try to keep them low cost so that our small businesses can um, access that training. We also produce conferences and other events in the spring. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. We do the Create Virginia Conference in conjunction with the Academy, um, the Academy Center for the Arts in downtown Lynchburg and the Office of Economic Development in Lynchburg. Um, that conference, <laughs> I think it was probably one of the last events at the Academy that we had for 2020, um, took place at the end of February this year. We invite artists from all over Virginia to get together to exchange ideas and um, attend um, training about doing the business of art better. So we focus on um, individual artists and how they are selling their work, um, marketing themselves as performers, those kinds of things. We also have um, information resources. We have we spend a lot of time helping people understand their um, their business. And as we're helping people, you know, work through their business plans and things like that, one of the things that we do is um, we can help you assess the competition that you have in your market space. So to do those kinds of things, we use a, we often use a tool called Growth Wheel. Um, and we also help you understand um, we can also help you get access to information about the market, either here locally or, or nationally through databases like IVIS. Um, or we can help you understand what, what are the free resources that you may be able to access, again, at the public library um, and those kinds of things. So, so all of those one-on-one -on -one services are, are really important. We try to focus that to, to help you, you know, grow and understand what's happening in your business or organization. You will notice that the one thing that we don't do as the Small Business Development Center is we don't do coaching and training for fundraising for nonprofit organizations. We, um, we just don't, that's just not in our, our purview. So, um, so while we do have a lot of nonprofits who come in to, to do, you know, other, the sort of businessy side of things, human resources, um, marketing, all of those things that are common to, to any organization, right? Um, but we don't, we can't, we don't sit down with you and, you know, help you, you know, work that donor list. Um, so, as I mentioned, a lot of these areas of assistance already, business planning, strategic planning, access to capital. So when you're ready to grow or expand or you're buying a building, um, how, do you, how do you write that loan package? Um, social media coaching is something I personally do a lot of. We, I have um, other 
other folks, other advisors who work with us, like I said, including Sharice, um, who have other kinds of expertise. We have Jamie Reynolds on board with us, who I know works with the Bedford Chamber pretty frequently, um, doing workshops and things. Jamie um, is brilliant at at financial forecasting. Um, he is happy to sit down with you and talk through those, those issues with your business. Um, we, have, we have a specialist right now, Anthony Andrews, who um, in the nonprofit space, this is a great example. Um, Anthony is working on some specialized program for early childhood education and, and operating early childhood, the business side of early childhood education, you know, working with those center directors to make those businesses run more smoothly. Many, many of our, our early childhood organizations in the community are nonprofit or faith-based organizations. And so that, that would be a good example of a specific in industry training that we're doing that would really impact um, the nonprofit sector. So as I said, we are located all over the Commonwealth and I like to make sure that, that we you know, share this information because you know, particularly with things that we're gonna post online, you might not be watching from Bedford or if you're, you know, <laughs> You know, if you're one of those residents who are maybe, you know, closer to Roanoke County or something like that, um, we do have uh, small business development centers that serve the Roanoke region and Franklin County and other spots. And here's the map. Um, we have, I love this, this little infographic. It always impresses me about my organization. We're amazing. Um, <laughs> In 2016, we had over 16,000 clients across Virginia and um, helped, helped earn about $345 million in capital investment improvement across the Commonwealth. So those are, those are ways that we, you know, that when we are helping businesses get started or obtain loans or other kinds of investment, that's, that's the number that we're measuring there. Um, and over 1,300 new business starts in Virginia in 2016. It's pretty amazing. And 41,000 training attendees. Um, you guys don't need to see that slide. <laughs> in the Lynchburg region, we have six advisors, as I said, who are subject matter experts. Um, just a reminder that advising is always free and confidential and we do work with businesses at any stage. Um, we will sit down even, you know, if you're thinking about starting a nonprofit organization, we can sit down and help you think that through whether, whether that idea is a nonprofit or whether it's um, maybe better suited to another type of, of organizational structure. Um, or if you're ready to, you're just like, man, I'm done. I'm ready to retire we can uh, help you through that process as well. And we also connect small businesses with other local resources in our region, such as economic development, banks or other partners. Um, Bedford County has, a, has two wonderful economic development professionals and Pam, um, who I know is with us somewhere today. And um, Tracy Bledo is your economic development director in, in, uh, for the county. And then we also have um, Mary Zirkle, who is the director for economic development for the town of Bedford. So you are blessed and you, you truly are in Bedford. You have some wonderful economic development professionals. Make sure you reach out to them and just let them know you're here. You know, they like to just sort of check in with the local organizations. Um, here's the stuff we don't do. We don't negotiate with or represent clients. Um, we don't write your business plan or your organizational plans. Y'all need to know your own businesses and organizations. We will coach you through that process and give you comments, but you got to do the work, guys. Um, and we can't provide direct accounting or legal services, but we can uh, answer those questions when we, when we need to. We don't make loans. Um, that is a big question that we get pretty frequently. Are you the SBA? Do you make loans? Nope, we will send you to the bank for that, but we'll help you, help you find the right bank and um, let you know what those SBA programs are or any of the other lending programs that are out there. We try to stay familiar with what, what our local banks um, or non-SBA related um, loan programs are out there. 
And as I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, programs like Create Virginia, other training that we do. We're a Grow with Google High Impact Partner. Um, it's, actually, it's one of my favorite programs. We help folks get listed appropriately on Google and use Google more wisely for their businesses. This is not a Google commercial, but um, <laughs> it's a really important tool. Um, so you, you're always welcome to call me and help and ask me your, um, you know, questions about how do I appear on the map with Google? Or um, I heard Google has free websites, but I can't figure this out. I can talk you through some of those pro processes. And like I said, we are hosted at the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance. And um, we work with our other local um, departments of economic development, tourism, our, um, the workforce of folks with that with Tim and all of our other local partners and I'm trying to think if I want to give you any other pieces of information um, you can contact me at skeener at lynchburgregion.org this is one of our many websites it's sbdclyhr.org or sbdclynchburgregion.org um, we are launching a new website next week, so you should be able to actually go to the website and book with the, with the advisor of your choice. Um, you can find us on social media. Just, just give us a search. Sharice did uh, mention some of our other training that we have. We have coming up um, marketing training. It's online. Let me actually... Oh, I don't have, I don't have that ready to go. Um, so I'm just going to stop screen sharing. Um, if you, I, I know you just like, you don't want to see people's like private computer stuff, right? You guys heard all about the people who had the, all the tabs up during their zoom class and people get fired over what's on their tabs. So just be careful. I'm just telling you that. Um, <laughs> Um, if you go to Facebook or to sbdclinchburgregion.org and click on training and events, you will see that on Tuesday mornings for the next four weeks, we actually have training about marketing um, in post-COVID coming up. Those are free trainings, and um, I recommend that you that you register for those. You could register for all of them. You could register for just one. The one that's coming up on Tuesday morning is called marketing in a post-COVID world. So we're just going to sort of talk about general marketing concepts. And then the following week is advertising in a post-COVID world. So, um, and the last one I think is social media. So if you also go there, you will see um, that we have some the YouTube of other training that we've done recently posted, and those are also free to access. And one of those is the time management training that Sharice mentioned earlier, where she got the tip about shelve it, right? From Jennifer, our fantastic trainer, Jennifer. Okay, it's 508. I don't want to take up too much time. <laughs> but I am you. happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. Way to bring it. I'm telling you what, every time. And just wanted to thank every single panelist here today for bringing such wonderful insight and information to our chamber members, nonprofit owners. Um, appreciate them coming on the call. And I wanted to just say two things. Bedford County is working on a grant for it's going to include nonprofits is what I've heard. So that's still to come and more information will be coming out in the next couple of weeks, but they are working on some grants for businesses and for nonprofits. Also the town of Bedford has already given two phases of their grants out and they're going to move to phase three is what I've heard. And that could include nonprofits as well. But we as a chamber will keep you informed on what is established and what is available for your nonprofit. So also wanna mention if you are hiring, we have a job fair uh, that is in person outdoors at the Forest Library, July the 9th. And so we're hoping for great weather, but come on out and there's lots of 
people, you know, out will be six feet apart, the booths. But um, if you are hiring, you definitely want to, to be there. So seek us out and let us know if you want to be a part of that. And we'll look forward to seeing you virtually soon. But is there any questions on the call today? We do not have a chat box on this certain call, so you can let us know if you do have a question. I do have a question. This is Susan. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, probably for Stephanie, and maybe you can give me contact information. This is related to the SBA, the EIDL loan, not the, mm -hmm. the advance that you don't have to repay, but an actual loan. I can't find any language or information specific to the repayment of the loan. And I know they give the terms and when the repayment, but it doesn't talk about, I mean, what happens if your nonprofit takes that loan out and then still goes belly up? Who's responsible for that repayment of that loan? And is there any forgiveness? I read an article today on CNBC News that says that the up, if you take less than 25,000 and something happens, it could be forgiven, but I can't find anything specific to that anywhere. Yeah, that is, that is a question that, I mean, you're welcome to ask me those questions. Those are certainly questions that the, that the SBDC fields. And that would, that would be a specific question that I would probably turn around and go to, go to the network for, because we do okay. have a couple of, um, a couple of, uh, not just tax pros, but a couple of attorneys who work with us. Um, my sense, and I am not an attorney, and uh, do not re represent, you know, <laughs> the SBA <clears throat> properly Disclosure. in this. <laughs> um, my, you know, generally those, the, the $25,000 or less threshold, that's where the loan is not, it's not collateralized in any way. Right. So, um, so yeah, you know, I, I mean, it would be, it would be rather expensive, you know, to, to try to collect those, um, you know, so I can, do you want to type up a question and email it to me and I will. turn that around okay. to the, to the network? Yeah. Um, just to get, just get, to get better, a better answer. Um, you know, your terms are 2.75 right. over 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're not going to pay, you're not going to start paying for, I think it's, it's at six months. Um, it's actually one year, a year. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, you know, it's, you're probably going to know something pretty soon. Okay. Well, I mean, we've already been approved for an amount, yeah. but we haven't made the decision whether to complete it and take an amount yes. because we don't have answers to those questions. We have, and, so, we have so many folks who are sitting on the EIDLs that we've started calling you idle idlers. Yeah. So, <laughs> Well, I only have 30 days left to make the decision. So yeah. <laughs> they let me know that. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, I, there are a lot of folks who um, have similar questions. So I'd be happy to take that. Okay. Question. I'll email you. Thank you. Network. Good question. Anyone else have any questions for our panelists? Well, again, we thank you so much. Great knowledge wonderful insight. And we look forward to really helping our nonprofits. There's so many out there. And what our nonprofits do for our community is what a lot of people can't do. And so they fill in the gaps. And so each one of them is so valuable to our economy and to our community, um, the validity of our community and the sustainability of our community. So um, please keep on keeping on. Let us know what we can do to help. And we are here for you. And so is all of our panelists. So seek us out. And with that, I will adjourn the meeting. But thanks again for coming on and being in tune to helping out our nonprofits. Thank you. Have a wonderful week. Rest of your week and weekend. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having us. We'll be in touch.